Hey guys, this is Alex Pierce from LightSailVR.com. After you've installed AP Octane, in the 3D viewport you can press N to open up the side menu, and you'll find AP Octane under the Octane tab. There's a new References tab, and this will bring you to my YouTube tutorial playlist, AP Octane documentation, the Octane for Blender official documentation, the Octane for Blender Facebook group, the Octane Node Wrangler site, and our website. Under the Viewport tab, the Materials tab, the Render Settings, and the Render Passes tab, there are a lot of buttons. They do a lot of important things, but I'm not going to talk about those right now. I want to focus more on the new features. Under the HDR tabs, you can press Add HDRIs. Then you can select any of these to choose the HDRI you want to use. In the World tab, you can see that the HDRIs are set up in a way that allow you to easily change things about them. You can also blur any HDRI from the World tab. Under the Examples tab, you can do Add Scatter Examples. If you click on this Scatter Master object, you can see how it's set up. You basically use the material to adjust everything, and I've labeled these so you understand what's going on. So if we want to have 100 instances, this is what 100 instances look like. If you want to change what object is scattered or where to scatter, you can do that here. So you can see I've just selected this monkey, but you could select a collection or an object. You can change the, the maximum and minimum scale and rotation and translation. And all these are worth exploring and learning a lot more about. But the two that are very interesting that took me a long time to figure out is how to paint on density. So you'll see that we have one texture plugged into relative density map and one plugged into Kohling map. So what that is, if we go over to our texture paint mode, and we'll go ahead and switch into, uh, we'll keep it in texture paint, but we'll go into rendered view. And now, if you're not familiar with texture paint, you don't have to know a lot uh, to get started. I'm just going to show you a few things here. So the main thing to check is over here under the tools, you have two different images that you can paint on, density map and culling map. And they work similarly, but they also can work differently. So the first thing I want to do, I'm actually going to bring over the shader editor so we can see it. And I'm going to increase my instances. I'm going to go up to 10,000 monkeys. That way it'll be super dense and I'll sort of know what I'm working with when I draw here. So right now the images, both images, they come, they're both white, completely white. So if under our density map, if we go ahead and click black and we paint on the texture, you can see over here that it's we can, actually, we can actually paint where the monkeys go or where they don't go. Of course, we can invert this as well. There's a few different ways you can do that. One is you can actually just invert the texture. And if you invert the texture, it will take it a minute to upload. But you can see now, wherever we paint black, we're going to get we're going to get the opposite. We're going to get monkeys instead of, of, of take them away. So we're going to go back here. And then the other thing is you can draw right on this plane. So you can actually texture paint right on this plane and you can paint whatever you want. Um, and of course, just like anything, gray, somewhere middle gray is gonna, is gonna spread less. Um, white is gonna be, you know, we, white will be none, but every shade of gray in between uh, will make a difference. So uh, let me go ahead and go back to here. Let me do a little bit more of this. And then let me go ahead and save this. So you can do image and then save. But the other thing is if you press Alt S, it will save it and it will update it uh, in Octane as well. So anyway, the main thing is to make sure you save it if you, if you like what you see. And then the calling map works very similarly. So if we, if we go to the calling map and we do black, we can get rid of those. So there's, it probably depends on your workflow, what's going to make sense and what's not. Let's say that this area in the middle, I know I don't want to have any whatsoever. I can go to my calling map and I can paint it black. And this calling map will override the density map. 
So anything I paint here is going to override what we have in the density map. So in the density map, I might want to get creative. So I might want to do some, you know, and I, I don't want to have to worry about accidentally filling in the middle. So you can see no matter what I do here, because we have a culling map with black, nothing's ever going to come here no matter what we do to this density map. So yeah, there's, there's a few different reasons this could be helpful. You might want to have a very consistent look and you could use both. Personally, I think for the most part, I'm just going to use one or the other, but it's there for you. It's set up for you to do it however you want. So feel free to use it as, as you wish. Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities with this. You can do some really, really interesting things and you can you know, follow the contour of the, of the mountain, etc. So that's something to, to keep in mind. If we add displacement examples, you'll get a few different examples here. So these three are all vertex examples of vertex displacement. So if we click on one of these, we can see how it's set up. This is just a simple dirt texture going into a gradient texture. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the user Corza, he's the one who sort of got me started on these. So you have vertex displacement into displacement, and then you can control the height here. You can change the subdivision as well. In this particular example, it's set up kind of well, so I'm not going to mess with that too much. But uh, then you can use these gradient texts to get, uh, yeah, different, various different, different results here. And you can see how they're set up: noise textures into transform values. Uh, if you if you click over these and change the scale, you also get some very interesting uh, effects. So if you want to flatten it out or if you want to sharpen it up, you can sort of use scale to do that. Uh, is this one as well? So the other two over here work the same way. They're just different examples of the same thing, basically. Uh, this last one is is texture displacement. So this is actually dunes that I created in World Creator. And um, again, I didn't spend too much time creating the, the color. I just used a dirt texture, gradient texture. Um, but the texture displacement, so we have the texture here going into texture displacement. And then you have your different settings here. And you can, again, you can change the height. And that will, that will affect the height, of course. Um, you can keep going up. One of the interesting things about this this texture displacement is that it's tileable. I made this specifically to be tileable, which means that this is actually the only texture displacement I have. This is a very low poly object, but the displacement looks excellent. I think it looks way better than Cycles displacement, to be, to be honest. This is tileable, so what that means is you can turn on arrays, for instance, and you could scale this to infinity if you wanted to. You could just keep scaling this, you can come over here and you can scale this and it will continue to repeat just like that. So it's very interesting. I think that the texture displacement in, uh, in, in Octane is, is really powerful and I highly recommend uh, you use it in your workflows if it, if it makes sense. Under the Vectron tab, you can add any of these objects and you get these really cool Vectron examples. And then under the Material tab, you can adjust this um, to your liking. So you can, of course, you can change all the colors, but then you also have all of these values you can adjust. While I was bug testing AP Octane, I created these renders just using the default Vectron objects. If you've never worked with fractals before, this makes it super easy and it's a lot of fun. Okay, now let's talk about light linking. To set up light linking, you need to go to the compositing window. You can do that just by clicking over to the compositing window and going into Octane. Or from the 3D viewport, you can press switch to compositing window. In the compositing tab, click on Octane and then go in order, one, two, three. First, add light mix group. This appends the light mix node. Second, enable passes. This enables all the light passes you're going to need. And then third, click set up light linking. And that's all there is to it. Now you're ready to do some light mixing. But first, we need to make sure our objects are set up with different light passes. Okay, I set up this simple example to demonstrate a point, and I gave it four separate color lights. And now to change these to light pass, what you have to do, click on the light, go into the material, and then change the light pass ID. Or the easier method is to use AP Octane under the light linking and choose your pass here. Now you can see it updates in the material, 
change this to four. You can select any number of objects, and even if they don't have LightPass IDs, you can still select it, and only the ones that have texture emission or black body emission will be selected, or lights that, that have those as well. Let's see, I will set blue light to two, green light to three, red light to four, yellow light to five, and now let's go ahead and render. After it's rendered, go into your compositing tab, make sure your backdrop is turned on, and then you can see we have our light mix set up here. Now there's a lot of things we can do. One thing is we can just turn off the background if we want the alpha to be off. We can also affect the brightness of our background. So if we want to turn the brightness down without making it go off or turn it up, we can do that. And you can see it's not affecting our objects at all. So we can, we can change the environment independently of the way the environment lights are seen. We can do, so under ambient, we can actually, this is the way that the environment, the, the HDRI is affecting our scene. So we can actually turn off our HDRI after the fact. We could actually completely get rid of it if we wanted to. So this is now, this is what it, the HDRI was adding, and this is what it was doing without it. So let's go ahead and keep that because it'll help us understand what else we're doing here. So now we have Octane Sunlight. It's not going to do anything right now because I don't have an Octane Environment Sunlight. Post-process, if you had any bloom or glare, any of that stuff, you can turn that down here. You can change it uh, however you want. But then here's where it becomes real interesting. So Light Pass 1 is probably not going to do anything. We don't have anything on Light Pass 1. I think it's sort of a default. Light Pass 2, you can see it's that blue light. And we can turn the blue light off or we can make it brighter. The other thing we can do is change the color. So if we want to just change the color, we want that blue to be, you know, yellow, we can do that. We can take the saturation down. So we can say, let's just make it a white light or let's make it super saturated. And we can do the same with all of these. I can change the saturation, the hue, we can completely change the colors here after the fact. So you could see if you if you've never used light linking before, you can get you can start to get an understanding of how powerful it is, the fact that you can basically relight afterwards. Okay, that's it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions. Make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Nailed it.